at this time. Um, okay. We're okay. Recording. So we've never. Okay, we've never had a meeting like this before with three guests, but we think it might be something that we'd like to continue in the future. Uh, let me begin by saying a few words about each of our panel members this evening. First, there's Terry Sprague. He's a country boy who grew up on a farm on Big Island and lives on, appropriately named, Sprague Road. He's known by practically everyone in the county and the Hastings Northumberland area through his writings in local newspapers, magazines, and his two biographical books. And I believe a third one might be in the works. Through the walks he's led and continues to lead to interesting natural areas and through his website, Nature Stuff, a veritable gold mine for anyone interested in nature. He's kindly allowed PECFEN to use this site for many years to provide information about meetings, outings, and our newsletters. We owe him a great debt of thanks. Terry was a founding member of PECFEN and of the Prince Edward Point Bird Observatory. He's received many accolades for his writing, such as the coveted Golden Quill Award for his newspaper columns, as well as many conservation awards, and is generally acclaimed as the most knowledgeable naturalist in the county. He continues to give a presentation to our club each year, participates in our bio blitzes, and has led many bird outings for us. His knowledge of the history of the county is amazing, and we always look forward to hearing from him. Then the next person that will be um, that Amy will be interviewing is Mark Stab. He's worked for the Nature Conservancy of Canada since 2006. He's now Program Director for Central Ontario East and oversees conservation projects in landscapes such as the Oak Ridges Moraine, the limestone landscape of the Napanee Plain, and around Prince Edward County and the islands and the shores of the eastern Lake Ontario. Last weekend, he was overseeing prescribed burns for NCC properties in and near the Rice Lake Plains. So he's a busy fellow. In the last couple of years, he's been instrumental in the procurement of the Hudson Rose Maple Cross Coastline Reserve, the area at Soup Harbor and McMahon Bluff properties in and near the south shore of our county. Back when PECFEN members could meet in person, Mark spoke to our club on several occasions about how we could help um, in, with these acquisitions. Mark is a longtime member of Ontario Nature and a founding member of North Durham Nature Club. He volunteered for previous breeding bird atlas projects and is looking forward to contributing again. He lives in Uxbridge with his partner Caroline Schultz and their two daughters, where they can be found hiking on local trails, often looking for flying squirrels. And finally, Pamela Stagg um, is known as the Bird Lady in Prince Edward County. That's a tribute to her radio program, The County Naturally, on 99.3, which teaches adults about nature. Although born in Britain, Pamela considers herself a Canadian through and through. In her previous life, she was an advertising writer and creative director who ran her own company for over 25 years with clients in Canada, the U.S., Mexico, and Great Britain. In 1987, Pamela tried her work, her hand, at botanical painting. Four years later, she won the world's top prize for it. Suddenly, her career expanded into practicing and teaching botanical art. Recently, her work was included in the exhibition Modern Masters of Botanical Art at the Royal Botanic Garden Kew in Great Britain. Kayaking is her passion, particularly when it involves Yukon's glacial lakes. She's also a keen bird watcher. Almost every year, Pamela gives us a presentation at one of our PECFEN meetings, and her radio program, program is an excellent way to find out what's important to know in the realm of nature. I'll turn it back to Amy now to follow up with her interview of these three impressive nature enthusiasts whom we were really fortunate to have with us tonight at this meeting. Amy? Okay, thank you, Sheila. That was terrific. Thank you very much. And I have to say that we're really pleased to have these three great friends of PECFEN who have come through very different paths to uh, do what they do to protect nature and teach about it. And 
um, so anyway, so what we did actually, this was, we had some help with Pamela, Sheila and I did. We met with her to come up with some good questions. So we have four questions that we're gonna each, that we're gonna ask each speaker. So we're gonna start with you, Terry, are you there? I'm waiting, I'm on the speaker view. So I wanna make sure that- um, I'm, I'm here now. Okay, great, <laughs> thank you, Terry. So, um, so we're gonna spend about, 15 minutes with each person and then we'll open up the chat for the, I already mentioned this before, but I'll just repeat it again. So Terry, the first question is, how and when did you first become interested in nature? Oh golly, I, I guess that would probably be back in the 1950s when I was growing up on the farm. Um, I guess being surrounded by nature every day, um, it's just natural to take an interest in nature. Um, and interestingly, I, I, as I recall, it, everybody thinks I'm the so-called bird man of Big Island, but actually it wasn't birds that I first became interested in on the farm. It was the plants that my father labeled as weeds. Uh, and somehow I didn't feel that was quite right. I felt, okay, you know, what is a weed exactly? And these plants are obviously here for a reason. So I, I want to learn a little bit more about the plants that I was identifying. Now, you know, <laughs> I dare say there wasn't much back in those days except the weed guide of, uh, of uh, the Department of Agriculture to go by. So I didn't have a whole lot to, um, to use as a reference. But um, I became somewhat proficient at identifying these so-called weeds to the point actually, where um, at the age of, I don't know, 14 or 15, um, I took the uh, provincial um, weed inspector to task for misidentifying uh, a so-called weed on our farm. He called it tansy. I said, no, it's, it's wormwood. And turned out I was right, <laughs> but he never apologized at all. Um, so I, I remember in my early teens, you know, that eventually I did take more of an interest in birds. And it wasn't until I actually uh, started going to, or I was going to school, but it wasn't until we started having a teacher by the name of Marie Foster in grades six, seven, and eight that I really took an interest in birds. She always came to school with these um, amazing stories about birds coming to her hands. And, and I think that's where, you know, that's where it really started for me right there. And it just took off from there. That's amazing, Terry. <laughs> um, well, thank you. How and when did you decide to focus on nature as a part of your life's work then? Well, I think as my interest grew, I, uh, I think it was when I started writing the column for the Pitt and Gazette in 1965 and uh, Phil Dodds, who was the editor, Back then, he, he insisted that I write this column, but he never really told me when to stop. So 50 years later, I decided, well, I guess it's time. <laughs> and and uh, so it was an amazing way to learn more about nature because you, you were inclined to, to learn in order to get more material uh, for each column. And it was a weekly column. Um, so when we sold the farm in 1976, didn't really know what I wanted to do. Uh, and I ended up working five years as um, a scale technician for Glenora Fisheries. And I started uh, getting interested in a field of nature that up to that time, I hadn't really been interested in before, and that was fish. Um, but when I was offered a position at Sandbanks Park as the park naturalist or assistant park naturalist in, in 1984, and our, our job was to interpret the nature. In other words, not just talk about what every species was, but how they all interacted and why they were so important uh, to Sandbanks. I think that's when it really took off uh, that I wanted to teach, that I wanted to teach people about nature. And it just, it sort of took off from there. Um, and then I moved on to Quinty Conservation and I developed an outdoor program there that ran for about uh, 15, 16 years, I guess. And then eventually when I retired from Quinty Conservation, I ran it through the Nature Stuff banner and um, 
still doing a bit of it. <laughs> That's amazing, Terry. Um, so Terry, how was, and you kind of answered this a little bit, but what was or is your training to work with nature? So you you have entered that into that a little bit, but do you have more to add to that? Yeah, I, I never really had any formal training uh, in interpreting nature other than a correspondence course that I took, um, oh, I guess it was back in the mid 1980s. It was on wildlife management and it really didn't apply to Canada at all. It was an American course, so it didn't really teach me a whole lot. Um, but it's mostly uh, I'm self-taught. It's just, uh, you know, through experience. And I found that if I learned something new, and I did learn a lot from the people who were on my guided hikes. You know, I do take exception to what Sheila said. She described me as, as being um, the most knowledgeable naturalist in Prince Edward County. No, I take exception to that because I'm still learning. And uh, I learned a lot from those who were on my guided hikes. Uh, we would have people on these hikes that were knowledgeable, say, in, in fungi or whatever. And if I used that information that I learned on a guided hike or in my column, then it sort of firmly, you know, <laughs> embedded in my brain and uh, I kept it. You have to use it in order to, to remember it. Um, so that's, um, that's how that all came about anyway. So really this whole time when you were trying these, doing these different jobs, like moving from the working with fish to sandbanks to Quinty conservation, you were also writing, you were doing the column. Weekly. Yeah. Yeah, 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 so it's kind of- uh, column, Not only for the Pitt and Gazette, but for the Trentonian and the Balvo Intelligencer for a while. And then there was a little paper out at Deserano called the Quinney Scanner that uh, I was a uh, roving reporter down there and I also wrote uh, the column. So yeah, I did, I did a lot of writing actually. I always say it's 2,600 columns, but that was only for the Gazette. You know, there was a lot of others too. Not to mention a couple of books or a number. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah work, working on the third. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay, so the last question is here, Terry. What from your experience do you think should be the focus of conservation today? Oh, I think continued education uh, right at the top of the list. Um, and we need, and when I say we, I'm talking about not only us, but developers, everybody, the whole world. We need to get beyond this mindset that wildlife and nature is important only because um, it provides entertainment for those of us who like to run around with tilly hats and shorts. It goes beyond that. Uh, we, we actually, it's critical to our own survival as a species. And I think it's important to, to know that. And we need to find a way to live in harmony uh, with our fellow species, I think. Uh, and I believe we have a long way to go before we accomplish that, uh, but we're quickly running out of time. Um, I think we've, um, you know, we've made some considerable progress. There's no doubt about that, uh, but we need to make more and we have to conserve the natural resources that we have left for once, you know, once they are gone, they're gone forever and, and there's no bringing them back. And it, it's, it's, um, it's important now and it'll be more important as we go down the road because as you know, the world population, human population is, is getting larger and larger and larger and uh, our resources are being depleted. So we need to, you know, we need to emphasize this, this uh, conservation of what we have left and our enjoyment of it. Yeah, thank you, Terry. That's, that, that is wonderful. I totally agree. And it's really wonderful to hear. Well, um, so I think we'll move on now to Mark Stab. Thank you very much, Terry. We'll bring you back for the question period. Um, Mark, are you there? I'm here. I'm here. Okay, great, great. Okay, so I'll Can ask you, you the first question. <laughs> great, yes, definitely see you. Thank you very much. So I'll ask you the first question. How and when did you first become interested in nature? First of all, I want to sort of explain why I'm on this program. <laughs> like, I'm with these two great dignitaries of the county 
So Pamela, I, I was having an interview with Pamela about a few, I've not forgotten which what, what it was. He says, you know, we should have something with stag or st stag, sprag, and stab. And she had, couldn't figure out what it was. And now here it is. So that's how I ended up on this show. So uh, thanks. Thanks for having me. You know, you've got so many people in the club with great stories. It's great to hear that you'll be doing this again. Um, so uh, I, I'll consider myself like the special guest for you for the show. Uh, so I, I kind of grew up in an urban setting and blue collar background. Um, we didn't have a cottage, didn't go camping really. Um, and I, I asked my mother this question years ago, you know, how did I get into nature? And she, she attributes a lot of it to television. So in, when at an early age, she would turn on, I was working, living with my mom on her own uh, for a good chunk of my childhood. And uh, she would turn on television programs that were nature oriented because she loved nature. She was in, still is in love with nature. So she would kind of direct us to those kind of programs and folks of, of kind of my era and so on might remember Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, uh, some of these Disney programs, uh, the Cousteau shows, remember Cousteau? And uh, so I, I got really fascinated. Then I started asking for those programs and then I would start training them on myself. So. Uh, you think that people on screen can they really get inspired about nature? I, I that was part of the background, but plus, uh, it was a, an era when you know kids can just go exploring places. And some of you may have seen that movie Stand By Me when these kids are kind of roaming down this railway track and they get into all kinds of adventures and trouble. Well, that's that was my wild kingdom. So we would go on these treks down to it was in Windsor, Ontario, uh, to a place called Little River. And we go swimming, and we picnic, and you know, watch birds, and uh, you know, you name it. So there are sort of wild opportunities where we found them, and kids can 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 get into that. They can a piece of green in an urban air, area can actually inspire them. So that was sort of my early early days. I also spent some time on a farm in Alberta, and maybe I'll talk about a bit about that in my next uh, next question. But I uh, I was shipped out to Alberta to my uncle's uh, big grain farm in southern Alberta. Uh, to work for him. And uh, I loved it. I loved working on that farm. Um, not that it was, you know, it was just good work. I, I like the idea of kind of a good day's work driving actually because of big toys, big tractors, big combines. But uh, he had a pr large ranch land with a short grass prairie, never been tilled, uh, had teepee rings from First Nations, uh, wild coolies and valleys that um, when I had opportunities I could go explore and that I think that was part of the background too just having a chance to explore these sort of wild open spaces. That's amazing. Where was this in southern Alberta? Uh, not far from Medicine Hat, a place called Turin near Tabor. Uh, he had four sections which is basically four square miles. That's that's the scale that they operated yeah. at the time. Um, yeah, he's long gone. Uh, he taught me how to swear at an early age, but also <laughs> taught me a good work ethic and had I, a really great experience there. That's amazing. Okay, then Mark, your next question is, how and when did you decide to focus on nature as part of your life's work? Yeah, so it was a good question. I started, had to think about that. So I, I have a feeling it was around high school. I had this one teacher, a geography teacher named Mr. Walsh, who, um, you know, we would study, you know, geography and physical geography, all that sort of thing. But we also get into um, the sort of my first introduction to the opportunity to make a difference about things, to fight for conservation. He would bring in a speaker from Ontario Hydro who would talk about the great wonders of nuclear energy. And he would sit behind him and go like this, you know, and, he, and, and all the kids in the class say, what? Are you actually questioning somebody talking about this? So that was a, an opportunity to kind of learn that, well, yeah, natural, you know, learning about nature is, is uh, you can question things, you can ex explore, you can learn more. Um, so I, I think he helped me kind of start thinking, oh, okay, I can explore. I can sort of uh, question and look into some research things like that. Um, but going back to the farm, um, I was at University of Waterloo. Um, I, I took environmental studies program there. And that was, a, I think, a big part of it. Um, and at one point, my uncle wanted me to stay on the farm and, and live out there. He didn't have any uh, kids. He had a, a stepdaughter who wasn't like a real farm kind of person. And he wanted me to stay. He wanted me to live there and forever I would be a farmer. And I thought seriously about it. I was like 17 at the time, really tough, kind of a difficult thing to consider at that age. But I remember thinking, I had enough of this environmental studies background that 
I know that farmers are, are great uh, stewards of land and I could really make a, a difference on that four square miles of land. Um, but I felt I wanted to do more. I wanted to have a, a, a bigger uh, impact or be involved in more different things. And at that point, I, I think I, I something twigged in my brain that, yeah, that's the direction I was gonna go. Wow. Okay, next question. What was or is your training to work with nature? Yeah, so it was at the University of Waterloo's, um, it's now called Environment and Resource Studies. Was, at the time, it was called Man-Environment Studies. That's how, how far back it goes when you actually said yeah. man and environment. Right. Yeah. Um, and, but in there, there was a kind of a subset of programs that were natural heritage oriented. And uh, that uh, still, people from the Environmental Studies program were kind of pioneers in the natural heritage inventory uh, process. Like so the, the first in the pro province were actually done by professors and teams and crews from Waterloo. And I got really fascinated by that idea that you can go into an area and study, you know, get your experts together, study all the different parts of it and come up with the story of the land, of the landscape like that. So that, that was a, a, a kind of big part of it. Um, Sheila reminded me that, yes, I did start a master's program on, and in forestry at U of T. And I'll admit publicly, I didn't finish that degree, um, but I, I did a lot. And that was where I did my flying squirrel work. And I was really interested in integrating wildlife into forestry uh, matters. Um, and I was well on the way to kind of completing the degree. Um, I, I had written actually the status report on the Southern Flying Squirrel, which put it on the species at risk list at the time. Uh, publications, presentations, lots of talks. I maybe even came to, to Peckfen to give a talk about flying squirrels way back when, before Jeff Bowman was the man to talk about flying squirrels. Um, but yeah, so that so that uh, got me some really great training. But then somebody put a job ad on my desk from Ministry of Natural Resources uh, of, for a, a private land uh, kind of stewardship program called the Community Wildlife Involvement Program. It was a coordinator position. I said, oh, well, sure, I'll apply. And I got the job. And I thought, okay, I can finish this degree while I'm still working. And I just, it never happened. Um, so I did a lot for flying squirrels. And I think Sheila would agree that like, you know, I gave a lot, a lot of talks and people knew more about flying squirrels, I think, because of what the work I had done. But joining the ministry at the time was really amazing because it was an era when there was so much passion, like every person working in their field was at the top of their game doing amazing work, including the fish fisheries people. I was on the wildlife side and people were, were working on, on uh, fur bears, on deer, on caribou, on moose. Uh, I was in kind of the non-game section, uh, but, but even they respected the non-game thing, except it was a real game-oriented ministry at the time. But to see the passion that people had um, really, you know, show that, yeah, stick with something, focus, and really you can have a, a major impact. Um, so that, that, was, that was, I guess, part of, part of that background. That was really the only training, and then just a lot of experience in different jobs since then. One, I guess one other thing I did... Um, Terry talked a lot about writing. I, I had had a column in the Shelburne Free Press and Economist for a while. It was called Apprenticeship in Nature. Because a lot of my buddies in Windsor worked in the car factories, right? And they were apprentices. So my column was called Apprenticeship in Nature. So I, and I, I've done a lot of freelance writing in, in the past. And I really fascinating, you know, really interested in, in education and interpretation. I applied for Algonquin Park interpretive uh, naturalist job. Never got it, Terry. Tried though. Um, so I really have a kind of passion for, for education and, and uh, helping people learn about stuff as well. That's wonderful, Mark. Thanks. Okay, so your last question is, what from your experience do you think should be the focus of conservation today? Yeah, so I'm working for the Nature Conservancy of Canada, which is a land trust. And what I should say is land secure. We've got to protect more land and ensure that at least a, a significant portion of the landscape is protected 17% or 20%, whatever it is, to ensure that certain ecosystems remain intact and then to manage and care for them into the future. But I think even more importantly is ecological restoration. That's, that's when I kind of thought, okay, what, how do I answer that question? Because um, there's more to uh, the ecosystem than just protected spaces. They're really critical and it's great to show stellar uh, management of these properties, but the landscape is much bigger than that. And ecological restoration, in my view, um, 
has impact on so many things, you know, on climate, you know, uh, climate change mitigation, biodiversity protection, and also community engagement. Like if you can get people involved in helping to restore things and see results, you know, people kind of get hooked on that. And it's not just on these protected spaces, it can be in private land, it could be restoring soil carbon on farmland, et cetera. So this is now officially the uh, UN e De or decade of ecological restoration. And I guess that's, that was kind of part of my thinking on this is that that's, I think that's a key, a key part of what we need to be working on. Well, we really, we really appreciate what the NCC is doing here in um, Prince Edward County. So that, that, that's wonderful. Thank you. What, what the carpenter said, we've only just begun. Yeah, we've only just, yeah. yeah. Together with, 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 you know, I, I will say something about, you know, I was so, um, so happy to be doing work in the county. I've been coming to the county for so long. Uh, I, and I appreciate the welcome that we've had. We, you, we, we honor and we respect the work of the Hastings Prince Edward Land Trust and what they can and have accomplished in the past. But to be welcomed as a real uh, contributor, as a partner, it's been really great. And I appreciated um, how, how we've been welcomed and, and the help we've got to make connections with landowners and continuing, people continuing to introduce us to landowners to say, here are some options into the future. So I just wanna say thank you to everyone you know, involved in kind of helping us do what we, we've done. We've done it together with you. Thank you, Mark. Okay, Pamela, it's your turn. <laughs> Parma, are you there? I'm here. Okay, before we begin with Pamela, I just wanna thank her too for, um, you know, it was her idea to do this. And when there was a time there when we were a bit panicked because we hadn't heard from Mark and we thought he wasn't coming. So then we began to think, who are we gonna put in as a third person? And that's when Sheila and I decided, you know what? We're gonna continue with this idea. So Pamela, you really started something. And I think it's a wonderful, <laughs> Wonderful thing because we can get in some of the history of our club too with various people and stuff. So thank you so much. And this was really started with a, you know, due to um, a, an interview that Pamela ran with Terry for the SSJI, which is on their YouTube channel. But this is a this is her idea that here are three different people coming from different backgrounds and all coming to really make conservation. Um, you know, a, a major part of their lives and kind of their life's work is, is quite amazing. So Pamela, are you ready for the first question? I'm ready. Okay. How and when did you first become interested in nature? My family moved over from England in the 50s and my American mother decreed that we would spend our summers in Maine because that's where she had spent her summers. So my family rented a series of cottages on Muscongas Bay in mid-Maine. And I didn't know it at the time, but a young naturalist named Rachel Carson was doing research and writing a book called Silent Spring on the other side of the bay. My favorite cottage that we rented had about 400 acres of spruce woods behind it. And there was a small pond and there was probably a couple of miles of undeveloped shoreline in front of the cottage. And there wasn't much to do. So I would go out and I would walk the trails and I would watch the green frogs in the little pond and I would poke through the rock pools and look for starfish and sand dollars. And when it rained, which of course it does a lot in Maine, I was teaching myself to paint and I was using wildflowers from the woods and the shores as my subjects. Um, I also learned to row. They had uh, the old peapod dories, the fishing dories uh, came with the cottage. And so I would go out in this peapod dory. Um, un untippable. We tried, my brothers and I, we tried to tip them over, but we couldn't. Uh, and it gave me that experience of being out on the water and seeing nature from a different perspective. My uncle came to visit us from Boston one year, and he brought Roger Tory Peterson's field guide to birds for me. And it was revolutionary at the time. Now, I still have it. And it, uh, all I can say is bird books sure have changed. Uh, this is a bird book from today, and we've got nice big pictures, one bird per page. 
but color reproduction was very expensive back in the 50s. So most of the pictures in Roger Tory Peterson were black and white, and the warblers all were on one page looking like this. But because they were in color, and because there were a lot of warblers in these woods, I decided I would teach myself to identify warblers. And um, if my uncle was trying to keep me distracted, he had a really good project because I'd, I'd see this bird in a tree and, oh, it's got some yellow. And I'd look in my book and, oh, a lot of them have yellow. And then I would go back and look at the bird and of course it had gone. Um, but for me, the interesting part of spending those summers on Muscongas Bay was that it put together some strands uh, that would become important in my life later. There was exploring nature, there was bird watching, there was painting flowers, and there was being on the water. And some of those evolved in different ways, but they came back later when I was retired. That's amazing, Pamela. Okay. How and when did you decide to focus on nature as a part of your life's work? It was a two-step process, or maybe I should call it a two-epiphany process. Uh, I had a very intense career in Toronto. I, I was writing advertising, I was painting, I was teaching, and it was seven days a week and sometimes often 20 hours a day. Um, and finally, in around 2000, my health started to break down. And I thought, okay, I've got to change. And long story short, I learned to kayak in, two, in the summer of 2001, and I fell in love with it. And in 2003, I had a very unexpected invitation to go up to the Whitehorse area. And as part of this invitation, I was able to spend a day out in the wilderness kayaking by myself. And this was gold rush territory. So I found a prospector's cabin uh, back from the shore a bit. And I thought, well, I'm going, to, I'm going to go have a look at this. And there was a, a beach, a, a pocket beach, maybe 30 feet wide, mud and stones. And I landed the kayak on the beach and I got out and I stopped dead because there in the mud, I could see that someone had been here very recently. And it was someone with big bear-shaped feet. Now, I hadn't had any bear training then. And so I thought, you know, I think I should leave. So I got into the kayak. But that moment on the beach was really literally life-changing. I was a city woman uh, with a career in the city. I had never been anywhere that even had black bears, let alone grizzlies. And it was a profound moment for me to be introduced to this real wilderness. And I flew, I flew home a few days later, and I remember having a meeting downtown, and there I was surrounded by skyscrapers and sidewalks, and all I could see was the coast mountains stretching back to Alaska and the glacial lake in front of them. And so three days later, I phoned Air Canada and I booked the next available flight back up to Whitehorse. And that was the trip when I decided I had to leave the city. I would happily have moved up there, but my father was very ill and would shortly die. Um, so I moved to Prince Edward County instead and that first year was hellacious. I was on the 401 for a year, uh, commuting first to visit my father and then settle his estate. And at the end of the year, I retired and I flunked retirement. It was boring, it was aimless. I wanted, after a hard driven career, I wanted more focus for my life. And first of all, I, put together the presentations on different nature study, uh, nature subjects, and I presented them uh, Southern Ontario up to Ottawa. And then in 2014, the um, about to become radio station board of directors approached me about doing a nature program on 99.3 County FM. And at first I said, mm, I don't think so, I can't handle the technology, but they backed me into a corner and said, you have to do this. So I did, and it turned out to 
provide the focus I wanted. And I realized that my mission in retirement had become teaching adults about nature. But the other thing that was important was I've seen young naturalists really struggling, trying to start a career. So I didn't want to take a paying job away from a naturalist. So here I am um, working almost full time on a volunteer job and loving it. That's amazing, Pamela, and we all love the program. Okay, so Thank you. what was, okay, wait a minute. And at this point, when were you painting? Uh, when did you do the botany painting? Can you just fill us in on that one? In the, when you, were you still working in Toronto and skyscrapers? Oh, well, I used to paint during the day to take advantage of natural light. I would write advertising at night and on the weekends and some evenings I would teach botanical painting. So it, it was seven days a week and very long hours. Crazy. Okay, your next question. What was or is your training to work with nature? I would say it's on the job. <laughs> um, researching and interviewing for the program is really like doing a BSc in biology where I get to pick the subjects and I get to pick the professors. Uh, I love it. The research is very intense. I interview a lot of people who are not used to being interviewed and sometimes it's their first time being interviewed ever. And I've learned that they can freeze and they can forget everything because ah, ah, I'm on the radio. Um, and so I, I've had to learn to anticipate the answers to many questions so I can prompt people if they do freeze. But there are other people who go way, way beyond the research I've done. And that's that those interviews are incredible. Those are the ones I remember. Um, and those are the ones where I learn even more than when I was doing the research. That's amazing. Okay, Pamela. So your last question, and actually that's kind of a theme actually with all three of you kind of learning on the job or also writing at the same time as you're uh, working. So you have that chance to kind of reflect on what you've heard and put all that, that information together. Um, but Pamela, the last question is, what from your experience do you think should be the focus of conservation today? I think there are two priorities. I'm not going to disagree with our previous speakers. I think it's a spectrum of things that we see as important. The first one for me is invasive species. I've done a number of interviews and the Great Lakes is one that we can see the damage they're doing. Lake Ontario, the lampreys came in the Erie Canal in the 1850s. Then we had the zebra mussels, which were attracted to hard surfaces. And now we have the quagga mussels, which will cling to anything. And those came in with ballast water from uh, uh, the Caspian Sea up the St. Lawrence Seaway. Um, we've got mute swans, and now we've got Asian carps coming in through the Chicago Ship and Sanitary Canal. The theory was that the electrical barrier would hold them back there, and it hasn't. So we're going to see a Lake Ontario probably in 50 years that is radically different from anything we've known, and we can't put the genie back in the bottle. It is what it is, and we are going to have to learn to manage it. Um, it would be easy to be very discouraged about the invasive species we're, we're seeing, you know, wild buckthorn, dog strangling vine, mute swans, phragmites. We're also having some successes, and I think it's important not to overlook those. The International Joint Commission spends millions every year on lamprecides to manage the lampreys in the Great Lakes and keep them down to a dull roar. We have beetles still being released to control purple loose strife. We have um, now elm, uh, 
on, on both sides of the Atlantic, we've had researchers developing elms that are resistant to Dutch elm disease, and now tree markers on commercial uh, forest properties are looking out for beaches which might be resistant to beech bark disease in the hope that we can uh, hybridize a beech tree which is resistant to beech bark disease. And one that in the panic over Asian longhorned beetles, we've overlooked the fact that that has been an amazing success story, Eradic eradicating that before it got lo loose in Canada and destroyed our forests. And the other thing about invasive species, it's very easy to say they ought to do something. We, we ought to hand it over to someone who will look after invasive species for us. And it's easy to forget about the personal responsibility that we ought to be taking on. For instance, don't transport firewood. That's how uh, Emerald Ash Borer got to Presque Isle and up to Ottawa. Uh, if you take a boat, a kayak, a canoe, any other boat from Lake Ontario into another body of water, clean it, dry it so that you're not taking zebra mussels or water chestnut seeds or some other invasive further into an unspoiled lake. And the other thing that um, was made very vivid to me recently, we often hike in many different places and we should be scrubbing our boots when, for instance, if we've been hiking at Presque Isle where there is Phragmites, where there is dog strangling vine, scrub the boots before we go up to Frontenac where there isn't a lot of that. The other priority, and this is a, a personal priority for me is, and, and Mark will love this, is habitat preservation. We can't save species if their home isn't there. And I am in awe of the work being done by the South Shore Joint Initiative, by Ducks Unlimited Canada, by Nature Conservancy Canada, and by Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society. Uh, not just here in the county, although it's wonderful seeing the work that SSJI and uh, the Nature Conservancy are doing on the South Shore, but I'm looking at the huge tracts of land like Old Man on His Back that the Nature Conservancy preserved out west, and the work that Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society is doing. They fought to the Supreme Court to preserve the Peel River in the Yukon from being developed. They're fighting for the Saskatchewan Delta. They're trying to get a buffer, a buffer zone established around Great Gross Morn in Newfoundland. And they're fighting for a national park in the Osoyoos des Desert out west. These are amazing things. And it shows what can be done if we all fight together for nature. Thank you, Pamela. It's so amazing to hear some hopeful stuff too. You know, as we look at everything changing. Yeah, that's really moving. Okay, so now I'm gonna to move to the question period. I'm gonna open up the chat box, see what's here. Um, there aren't a lot of questions. There's a greeting from, um, okay, so, Oh, there we go. I've got to, sorry, I'm not very good at this. I've got to look through this. Uh, great. Um, okay, the voice of the county. Okay, we actually don't have any questions. Does anybody have any questions that they want to, um, to uh, type in at this point? Mark, would you like we to left say something? Okay. <laughs> we can just start talking. Mark. A lot of questions. One thing I would add uh, to what Pam was talking about in terms of invasive species, like restoration work does kind of address that as well. Um, if folks want to Google Long Point Phragmites Action Alliance, it's yes. a massive project that is actually making a difference in terms of Phragmites. So it's Phragmites mm -hmm. have once covered all of Long Point, all of Turkey Point, and through a coordinated strategic and very expensive effort, they've actually cleared cleared the decks. So now Turkey Point Marsh, if any of you have been driving down that, you know, South Shore, Lake, uh, North Shore of Lake Erie and overlooked that Turkey Point Marsh it was once all Phragmites and it's gone. Um, and so it was, a, a, you know, I think they started in 2015. 
they got special permission to use certain um, approaches from the province to enable them to do this. And now the alliance is going further afield. So they're going actually re reaching out into all the headwaters of the streams that feed into the Long Point Bay and Turkey Point as well to address Phragmites issues on private properties and other properties that feed that are the seed source for these Phragmites populations. So it's a it's a massive effort and it actually is working. And they are working on, you know, they learn from so many community groups have been trying to battle Phragmites in different ways, learning from their experiences and are now applying them in a strategic way. And it's actually, it's working. Um, so it's a, it's a massive effort to get it back to some kind of a natural state, but then the cost of maintaining it is far less once you kind of have got over that hump. But it actually is, it's uh, very heartening that um, it can be done, it can be done. So. Mm -hmm. that, that's amazing. I, I wanted to say something on that. Um, a couple of years ago, we had a really great talk at PECFEN given by Erling Armson on some of that Phragmites removal, which I believe was at Long Point, some of it. I did hear from Andy Margotson that he died about three weeks ago. So I just want to acknowledge yes. Erling and how terrific he was. Sheila and I once tried to drown Phragmites off a of Trumper Road in 2017 when it was really, and he told us, he got us permission to go on the property. He told us how to do it and everything. And then of course the water started receding. So I don't know if we did any good or not, probably not. Um, but anyway, so I wanted to acknowledge that, but it is good to hear um, of, of um, I will be doing a program tomorrow, rerunning an interview I did with Erling on Ducks Unlimited. Um, he was so passionate. Mm -hmm. He was a joy to talk to, and I learned so much from him. Yeah, I mean, you did that around that time that we that he came to speak to Peck Fan. I remember that because you let me, because I'd missed the program. So you sent me that, which was really terrific. Um, yeah. Terry, what are your thoughts? You probably witnessed a lot of um, invasive species moving in the county in your well, um, lifetime too here. Definitely, yes. Uh, purple loose strife, of course, was probably at the top of the list uh, back a number of years ago. And, uh, oh, can't think of his name now. Uh, last name was Corrigan. He was uh, the head one for introducing uh, Gallarusello beetle that fed on the, the loose strife. So I had an opportunity to see what he was doing at Guelph University, which was quite a treat for me and um, work with him in release and a few release sites in Prince Edward County and could actually see the results of it. But since then, um, you know, the one plant that has really, um, I, I, I think stood out for me has been Phragmites. And that is especially true at Wellers Bay. There is an old original channel there through the sand spit that dates way back while it was actually created by what is known as an ice shove where a couple of uh, winters during the 1800s, the ice actually shoved and created a natural channel which was deep enough to um, admit large, uh, uh, schooners in there. And I led a kayak trip up there. I believe it was 2004, I think it was, and it was shallow. You could actually uh, paddle through it. Um, you couldn't take a big boat through, but you could paddle through it. It was maybe a foot deep at that point. There was a little Phragmites on either side, but nothing that really disturbed me at all. And I went back four years later with another group. You couldn't see where the channel was. It had completely grown over with Phragmites that was at least 12 feet high in places. And it had created little separate islands in the shallows. Now I haven't been back since, so I have no idea whether it's probably worse now, but uh, that, that really upset me, you know, to, to see a channel that had been there for so many hundreds of years probably just suddenly disappear in the space of four years. Wow. Yeah, I've certainly seen it, you know, grow all around here. So just even in, in driving, say, to Ottawa or Montreal all along the highways too, but, but yes. that and 
Prince Edward County. We do have a couple of things now. We have a, a raised hand from Mark, but first we have two questions on the uh, comment, a question from Tiffany. Have you worked with indigenous groups for conservation efforts? Uh, Mark, would you like to take that one? Sure, um, thanks to me. Um, we early on, we were talking about our work in the Rice Lake Plains and our, our uh, inspiration for tall grass prairie restoration has been the work of Alderville First Nation at the Black Oak Savannah site there with Rick Beaver uh, and now Chief Mowat, who was actually was involved in helping to establish the Black Oak Savannah there. Um, so we've collaborated with them for many years um, in something called the Rice Lake Plains Partnership. We supported their work, they supported ours. They uh, grow um, tall grass seed that then we use to restore our sites. Um, we've raised money to help support their work. We've helped actually expand their, their protected lands there. So that, that's a really great partnership that evolved over many years, but at a, at a, at a national level, we're, we're working really hard to be uh, better partners with First Nation when it comes to land and land conservation and collaborating with them. Um, so there's lots of work underway across the country to try and uh, solidify a relationship with First Nations at a local level and at a higher level as well to make impacts together that are mutually beneficial. Um, locally, though, we did actually just um, successfully raise some money to do some grassland restoration uh, with folks at the Mohawk so Bay of Quinty. Um, so the, the First Nations Technical Institute, which is a, an educational institution at in the the Tyndanaga Reserve uh, has this big airport area. I'm not sure if you're aware of that. They actually have a, a flight school there where you know young people from across the country, in First Nation from across the country, come and learn how to be pilots there, which is amazing. Imagine the stories of these kids coming to this area to learn how to fly. Anyways, there's this, an airport. I think it may have been left over from the Second World War. Um, but a large area of grassland and was built on Alvar. So there's Alvar remnant species there. And we've been trying to find a way to kind of work with the First Nation there. Uh, and it, Nicole Storm is their contact there. And we were successful in raising some money to do a, a, a pilot grassland restoration at that site uh, for the benefit of biodiversity, but also to link to the programming that is evolving there at the Institute. They have a, a, a Indigenous foods kind of program, which is based on native species. And part of the effort is to not just benefit, say, grassland birds, but also build the, the community of plant species there that are native that could be a teaching or uh, tool as part of that program. So that's really exciting. We just heard about that funding recently. So we're gonna be working on that in the next, next year or so. So, you know, short answer is uh, on a case-by-case -case basis with individual First Nations, we are having individual projects that are uh, helping to grow our relationship with them. But also there's lots underway at, at a national level to try and make a, a stronger connections there as well. That, that, that's terrific, Mark. Um, we have a few more, we have a conversation going on on the chat about Japanese knotweed. George Amaro wrote to everyone, I'm currently dealing with an invasive species called Japanese knotweed on my property. Not sure how invasive it is in the county, but it's hugely problematic and very, very difficult to eradicate. I'm smothering it as that seems to be the best natural advice. I wonder if any of our guests have come across this weed and there and John Foster writes about it and Susan Warwick, who's master gardener. And um, so that's great. And then I have another question after that. So would any of you like to discuss Japanese knotweed? I don't have any experience with it. Thank goodness. <laughs> I make a comment or two, uh, Amy. Sure, quickly. As a, director at large yeah. on, as a director at large on the Ontario Invasive Plant Council, uh, we have a um, best management practices guide for uh, Japanese knotweed that um, maybe some of the members here might wish to uh, obtain in PDF form from our website, which is www.oipc.ca. And the uh, best strategy for uh, amateur uh, gardeners in the county is to uh, actually dig up the uh, Japanese knotweed, um, pilot, put it into uh, some uh, dark um, uh, garbage bags, uh, leave it to dry out in the bags for about three weeks, and then dispose of it at your uh, local uh, landfill uh, if you have permission to do so. Um, that seems to be the best strategy with the Japanese knotweed because if you don't uh, dig it up, 
then it'll send rhizomes underneath the ground and uh, pop up in uh, various other uh, places. Yeah, uh, and I'll mention too, John, you're giving me the opportunity to mention that SSJI in one of their webinars had Amanda Tracy, who works with Mark, um, talk about invasive species. And that's on the, if you go to YouTube and, and type in South Shore Joint Initiative, you can see a recording of her talk, which was excellent about some of the invasive species yes. that really love limestone. Uh, Mark, did you want to say something too? Okay. No, no. Okay. I wasn't sure if somebody jumped I in. Said Amanda is the best. That's all. Okay. <laughs> all right. So we have a, I have a question here from Paula. What is the most remarkable thing you've ever seen or experienced in the county? or elsewhere? <laughs> That's a big question for all three of you. <laughs> you talked about the bear, <laughs> the bear tracks, Pamela, but one of the uh, most- that was, Yeah, yeah. That was in the Yukon, but uh, going back to that time, 2004, when my father was dying, there was an amazing display of Aurora Borealis one night. Uh, I had never seen anything like it, even up north. There was every form, there was every color, and I just stood outside and watched it for ages. And the indigenous people up north believe that the aurora lights the trail to heaven. And so I said goodbye to my father that night in the field, and I never saw him alive again. Wow. That's really something, Pamela. Anybody else? Terry, do you want to take a stab at that one? What is the most the re most remarkable thing you've seen in the county? <laughs> um, I think I have to agree with Pamela because I had a similar experience. Oh gosh, it was back when I was on the farm and uh, the aurora borealis was everywhere in the sky. Normally you see it only in the north, but there were, and this was actually making a sound uh, Pamela, yes. have you ever heard, you've heard that? Yes, I've heard <laughs> it. like it, a, yes. an electrical sound and yes. then it disappeared. Um, I think Henry had his hand up uh, to ask a question, didn't you, Henry? Uh, well, thank you, Terry, for recognizing me. Thanks, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, yeah. <laughs> um, I'd like to say a, a word on behalf of mute swans, which uh, Pamela identified as an invasive species. Um, we get dozens of them on Muscody Bay, and they're very useful because they keep the weeds down. You know, the bay would be horribly infested with, uh, choked actually, with weeds, especially off our shore, if they weren't feeding uh, can almost continuously. Uh, and, and frankly, they're beautiful birds. You know, when uh, my wife and I see 40 or 50 of them uh, feeding off our shore, we almost feel like members of the royal family. <laughs> I, don't, I don't share that sentiment. <laughs> Although, Terry, you had us feeding them that one year, you know, one of those winters. We went to the. Oh, I know. <laughs> I know. We went back and forth on that one, and we actually put out corn for them when, you know, the Great Lakes uh, you know, were about 90% frozen. <laughs> I remember when the first mute swan uh, appeared in Prince Edward County. It was on Consecon Lake. I believe it was 1961 or 1963. And we all jumped up and down with excitement, you know, thinking this is wonderful. And then another one came and now we probably have the highest population anywhere in Eastern Ontario. And beautiful they may be, they are creating a lot of havoc with um, uh, native species and uprooting a lot of the very vegetation that Henry has just uh, has mentioned, you know, that, that other species feed on. So. Should there be a control? Yes, I do believe there should be, but can we sell it? No, <laughs> you're never going to sell it. Um, Mark, would you like to take a stab at your the most amazing thing you've seen in the county? Oh, okay, sure. Actually, I remember what I wanted to mention before. Part of the idea of this Long Point project was, yes, to test various techniques, master them so that they can be applied elsewhere. So part of our vision is to apply the same approach to a place like Presque Isle Bay and Presque Isle Park and so on. So that's, that's part of longer term plan to actually have a Phragmites uh, control uh, effort in that large area. Where actually, there's a lot of mute swans there too. We'll get into that. Um, but your question, so 
honestly, I've never seen a place like McMahon Bluff. It, it, you know, if you, from the water, from the inside, it, it is really spectacular. And uh, the place right now, it's it's close to public access. We're going to be doing a property management plan, full inventory, need to determine what the best way is to have access to the property. Um, so we're really looking forward to welcoming club members there in some way, in some fashion, to let them see. Some of you have seen the site. Uh, it, it is amazing. But what I wanted, really want to say is I love the skipping stones of Prince Edward County. <laughs> I, I literally, one of my arms is longer than the other because of all the skipping I do. It's, to me, it's, it's like therapy to go out and just skip stones. Every, like I, I don't, there are very few of those beaches that don't have amazing, like shingle beaches or cobble beaches or whatever. They don't have the most amazing skipping stones anywhere. And uh, I don't know, it's, it's a common thing, but it's, it's the best. <laughs> That's great. Okay, I'm looking through the chat to see if there's something else and I'll go through any hands up or anything like that. Um, no, okay, now I've got to move my screen around to get back to here. Um, well, do you all, I, I'd like to give you each a chance to say a last word because we're getting to the close of our meeting. Um, and I'll start with you, Terry. Um, it's been wonderful to hear about, you know, to hear your answers to these questions. Is there anything that you'd like to say before we close down? Oh, wait a minute, I, I would like to say something. I wanted to mention to Mark, because we when we first opened up, he was talking about doing these burns at the Rice Plains. And I mentioned that I'd gone to Hazel Bird, uh, the, the Hazel Bird uh, property uh, near um, the Rice Plains. And mm -hmm. Terry, I remember looking at your, your um, footage that you shot the Super 8 footage and we showed a bunch of it that you shot in the 70s. And you actually mm -hmm. have Hazel Bird on some of that yes. footage. Molly Malloy recognized her who grew up in that area and was part of the kids club that would go out with Hazel. So I want to mention that just so Mark knows about it. And that's oh, now- yeah, Terry, I, I gotta see that footage. I gotta that's, see that. <laughs> and I have it and it's in the Wellington archives too, Mark. Oh, amazing. So it's really okay. amazing. Um, well, you know, yeah, yeah, one, yeah. one of the advantages of, of being, how shall I put that politely, elderly, a uh, senior, is that a lot of the people whom you've mentioned tonight, like Hazel Bird, you know, I, I was close friends with uh, years ago when she mm -hmm. started the Bluebird project up there, which I believe is the same property that is now set aside as the reserve. Yeah, yeah that well, was the idea. That, yeah, okay, great. And uh, I remember that so well. Um, Amazing. And I, I just want to conclude by saying that, you know, I, I was really flattered to be invited tonight uh, to be among the, the three, uh, you know, the, the other two panelists. It's quite an honor for sure. Because when I was on the farm, I never expected that any of this would ever take place that that was not my destination in life I thought my destination was how many pounds of fertilizer to put on a field of corn and and you know the proper direction to drive on a windy day when spreading a load of manure to me these these were important things and I thought that was the you know that was my destiny and I am I, I've mentioned this many times uh, when I was at Sandbanks Park on stage that I felt extremely privileged uh, to be working in a field uh, that I enjoyed so much. And I, I appreciated this more when I talked to some of the campers and they would tell me the most depressing stories about their jobs that they had. I mean, no wonder they came to the park to, to camp, you know, to get a, a, how fortunate I was that I was able to work in that field. Wow, Terry. <laughs> Pamela, I mean, no, sorry, I'm going alphabetically. Mark, is there something that you would like okay. to conclude with? Sure. Um, Wait a minute, I, I just, just want to say before you do that, that Terry, we're so lucky to have you. Sorry, I'm really bad at this, but because <laughs> yeah, I moved and I'm trying to think and listen. Okay, so now you, Mark, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. I'm not sure if you noticed, I changed my hat. Here was my nature conservancy hat. I've now had my antenna. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and a little quick story about the Hazel Bird property. So we knew it was significant. Paul Catling knew it was significant. It had lupin on it. Uh, there were Eastern hognose snakes around it. And when it came up for sale, we were fortunate to be able to buy it. And when we had the offer in, we started fundraising. We talked to our friends at the Willow Beach Field Naturalists. I told them about the property and said, well, 
that's where Hazel Bird took us. And Hazel Bird is a single mom with like five or six kids, didn't drive, had every club member who had a car drive her around to take care of literally hundreds of bluebird boxes. It was an astonishing accomplishment for a citizen scientist before they even called it that. So it's just a natural that um, we would name it after Hazel. And uh, actually we have a, a landowner giving us 96 acres to the north of this property. And we found some of Hazel's boxes on that property as well. So really cool. We have an annual event, it's Hazel Bird Day. We're kind of doing an online version of it next week, actually a week from, uh, week from today, actually. I'll send a link to, to Amy, maybe she can send it around if folks are interested. And I am so keen to get that here, see that footage, Terry, that would be amazing. <laughs> we have actually their family comes out and their grandkids to the, to the site. It, it's really a fun community kind of affair. Well, that and same it, day she introduced me to Peter's Woods, which hadn't even uh, been purchased yet. And uh, that was quite a treat. So I can, can understand why I enjoy going back to the Castleton and Centerton area so much. Oh, for sure. Yeah, so hope that we can love, love to have the club out for a tour sometime when it's safe. Uh, happy to show you around. Uh, and, and like Terry, I, I'm, I'm humbled to be invited to be part of this. Like, you know, really, I'm just, you know, doing, doing my job. And I love the county and I, I really appreciate the relationships we have with, with the club and with, you know, members. Um, so that, that's really grateful. I'm really grateful for that. Um, I, I've been thinking one other thing. I want to put a plug in for John Taberge. Anybody ever heard of John Taberge? He's an yes. author. He wrote a book called Wolves and Wilderness. He was one of my professors at Waterloo. And he was one of those guys who was a really good scientist. He was totally committed to the species he was trying to study. So it wasn't just about learning about the species. It was learning so that we can conserve them. And uh, so he was quite an advocate. He, he still remains an advocate. He's actually involved in that Soyuz uh, effort to turn that into a national park, for example, that he lives out in BC now. Uh, but he also was a writer and he kind of inspired me to get into it. So props or you know, kudos to John Tiberius because he was an inspiration to me as well. Anyways, that's just final thought. Uh, thanks. And uh, I look forward to seeing whoever else is going to tell their story next. <laughs> it's a great so, mark. Thanks, thanks so much for having me. It really has been fun. Oh, it's, it's, it's terrific. Um, there's one comment from Jerry here, and then I'm going to go give it to Pamela to say her last word. Jerry wrote, John, you might be happy. I think she's talking to John Foster, perhaps. You might be happy to know that we've had a family of trumpeter swans here this winter. They chased the mutes away from the corn people were putting on the ice. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Pamela. And I just want to point out that Pamela with her radio show had to learn all the technology, which is not easy. I really, I mean, you know, we're talking about writing, putting your thoughts too, but also having to work with technology. Even for me, I have enough trouble with Zoom. Um, doing all of that is just amazing. Okay, Pamela. The learning the curve was straight up. Yeah. And uh, I never expected to do it because the deal was when I went to the station, I would have an editor, but that didn't happen. So I did have to learn it. But I'm, I feel very fortunate living in the county and being surrounded by people who care about nature and who are willing to go out and fight for it. We're very unique here that people are so committed to conservation. And I'm also in awe of all the people I interview on the radio, like Erling Armstrong, like many, many people that are far too numerous to name. Uh, they are my inspiration. And it's such a joy to talk to people like that every week. Thank you, Pamela. Now there's one thing Mark pointed out, looks like a hand up from Joe. Is that Joanne? Um, so Joe, I'm sorry if I, will you please come on? Just, just open yes. up and ask your question. Thanks. I, I, have a, I have a quick question. This morning I saw something in my yard that I've never seen before. It was a bushy-tailed gray squirrel carrying a black squirrel in its mouth. Like, what was that about? Wow. Anybody, can anyone comment on that? Terry, do you have anything to say about what that could be? Would it be a juvenile that it was carrying? Because there are two different um, morphs, black and gray. So it could have been, you know, just uh, a young one that it was carrying off to another location. That's the only thing I can think of. Yeah, that, that makes sense. It's the same species, basically, just different colors. Yeah. I've actually seen flying squirrels carry young and glide from one tree to the next. 
uh, when they're moving from place to place. So that that was that was a quite an observation. But, <laughs> I, but I think you're right. I agree with Terry, and it's probably could be a young one. Wow. Thank you. Okay, you all, I'm gonna end the question period now and hand everything over to Jerry, who's gonna do our thank you. But before we do that, I wanna just remind everybody for our next members meeting, which will be the iNatural workshop, I have to look at the date, with, um, with, uh, with Carrie Gunson, who is also a great friend of PECFEN. Um, and that will be on Tuesday, May 25th. And we'll be sending everything out to members. And I'm, there are also notices about this one that will go through PEPBO, the Bird Observatory. And um, so anyway, I just want to remind you of that. Okay, Jerry, it's up to you now. Jerry, you need to unmute. Uh, so, um... I'm privileged to be able to thank you three. Um, so thank you from the depths of our hearts, I'm sure I speak for all of us, for a fascinating evening. It was so interesting to hear about your different backgrounds and, uh, and your passion for, for your areas. We are indeed very lucky to have you here. And it's very moving. Um, I love uh, Pamela, that you encourage us all to take personal responsibility because there is something that there is that we can do ourselves. There's always something. So look around and see what that is. And um, then I have speaker's gifts for you all. Um, I think you probably can't really see them. But we will get them to you and we'll figure out how to get marks to Uxbridge. Um, little tokens of our gratitude for everything you do for us and for nature. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Can I make this an essential trip so I can pick up my gift to the county? That way my <laughs> <laughs> and your maple <laughs> syrup. <laughs> yeah, well, there you are. Thank you very much. I think thank it's you. very essential. Yeah. Let's pass well, it to the screen. <laughs> what did you say, Terry? Just pass it through the screen. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Zoom can do a lot, but not quite that yet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, um, I, I want to thank everyone for coming to our members meeting. And um, it's been terrific, really terrific to hear from all of you. And to this is a very moving night. So uh, thanks a lot. Thanks to Jerry and to Sheila and to Pamela for suggesting this to our guests for coming. And to all of you members or non-members who have come to the talk tonight too, thanks a lot and um, wish you best in these uh, crazy times. Stay safe and uh, hopefully see you soon by Zoom, if not in person. Okay, good night, everyone. Thanks everyone, good night. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks. Thank you, night, night. Night. Night, Jill.